During my junior year in high school at the age of 16, my schedule consisted of nine periods per day. The highlight was fifth period, which served as my lunch break, followed immediately by my astronomy class, located in one of the school's basement classrooms. In the sprawling expanse of my high school, spanning three floors, the demand for classrooms surpassed the available space. As a solution, two classrooms were constructed in the basement, a place that once served as a janitorial area and exuded an eerie ambience when unoccupied. Despite its previous function, the basement had undergone a transformation to resemble a typical hallway, with one notable exception. There were no intercoms or loudspeakers at that time. Consequently, the basement remained silent during the morning announcements, earning it the moniker, The Chamber. Students coveted classes in this secluded section for its air-conditioned comfort, perceived ease of courses, and the luxury of having its own bathroom. On a particular day when we had an astronomy quiz, I found myself finishing early, a testament to my familiarity with the subject. With a sense of boredom creeping in, I decided to reach out to a friend in the other basement classroom. After a quick text, we agreed to meet in the basement bathroom. Following this plan, I exited the classroom, strolled down the narrow hallway and entered the basement bathroom. In a matter of seconds, the door swung open and my friend JJ sauntered into the bathroom. We indulged in some banter until JJ glanced at his phone, revealing a text notifying him of a school lockdown. Our exchanged grins mirrored the shared thought that this unexpected turn of events presented a unique opportunity. We had slipped away from our respective classrooms unnoticed by our teachers, granting us unrestricted access to the school during the lockdown. Intrigued by the prospect, we decided to sneak upstairs and explore the dimly lit hallways just for the thrill of it. The potential consequences were minimal, perhaps a brief explanation about the basement's lack of audible announcements when we opened the door to the main floor. However, upon our ascent, we were taken aback by the complete darkness. Typically, hallway lights stayed on during lockdowns, but this time they were all turned off. This departure from the norm heightened our unease, leaving us uncertain about venturing further. Stepping cautiously into the dimly lit hallway, JJ and I exchanged glances. As we looked down the corridor, a figure emerged from the shadows. Initially indistinguishable, we struggled to determine if he was a teacher. However, as he approached, it became evident that his attire deviated significantly from any staff members. He looked more like a disheveled outsider, dressed like a vagrant. Quick, let's get back to the basement. I urged JJ as we hastily descended the stairs. He acknowledged, expressing that he had indeed seen the mysterious figure. Upon reaching the basement, we noticed both classrooms were sealed with their doors shut and lights extinguished. To avoid drawing attention, we opted to conceal ourselves in the bathroom. With a swift motion, I turned off the light and both of us squeezed into the corner stall. The room fell into complete silence. No hum of ventilation, no hum of heaters, just the rhythmic sound of JJ and me breathing, occasionally interrupted by a drip from the sink. Suddenly, the bathroom door swung open, allowing a fleeting moment of hallway light to invade the darkness before the door swiftly closed again. Pitch blackness enveloped us as JJ and I strained to control our breathing. The silence was so profound that we could discern someone approaching our side of the bathroom. The footsteps halted, replaced by heavy breathing, intensifying our fear. In a moment of imprudence, JJ whispered in my ear, suggesting that I crawl out through the other stalls. However, even in the hushed atmosphere, JJ's whisper seemed to echo across the room. The heavy breathing outside our stall ceased abruptly as the person attempted to push the stall door. Sensing the urgency, I whispered, Go! JJ, go! Swiftly maneuvering, JJ and I crawled beneath the side wall from one stall to the next until we emerged on the other side of the bathroom. The person outside was now aggressively banging on the stall door. Reacting quickly, we rose from the floor, swung the door open, and as the light flooded the room again, we were startled to find the same man from upstairs in the corner. Without hesitation, we raced to JJ's classroom where the teacher promptly ushered us in. Within seconds, JJ explained the situation to the teacher, who locked the door, revealing the alarming detail of a gun protruding from the man's pocket. 
The revelation left me in disbelief since I hadn't seen a gun myself, but I played along. In normal circumstances, high school students might find humor in two peers causing a scene like this, but the gravity of the situation was palpable. A sudden bang at the door sent shivers through everyone, eliciting fear from a couple of girls. JJ, the teacher, and I observed the man standing at the door, peering through the window and attempting to open the doorknob. After a few frustrated attempts, he turned and retreated down the hallway toward the stairs. The duration of the lockdown remained uncertain, but for over an hour, we sat in tense silence in the classroom. The teacher intermittently posed questions with a concerned tone, shaking his head in response to our answers. Eventually, someone from upstairs contacted the teacher, instructing us to single file walk up the stairs and exit the building. Outside, we were met by police officers. JJ and I provided detailed descriptions of the man to both the cops and the dean. A pat on the back from one of the officers marked the end of our involvement, and we were sent home after the unsettling incident. The school responded to the incident by implementing an extensive network of cameras and increasing the security budget. However, this event never garnered media attention, leaving us in the dark about whether the police apprehended the suspect. Reflecting on that moment in the bathroom stall, I, now a retired New Jersey police officer with 20 years of service, remain convinced that the man had sinister intentions, possibly intending harm. One of the most unsettling calls during my tenure came from a nearby middle school during a stormy and dark day. For legal reasons, I'll refrain from disclosing the school's name. My car number crackled over the radio, instructing me to respond to a school lockdown. A suspicious-looking man had been spotted emerging from a white van parked behind the school and entering through the back door near the boys' locker room. Pulling into the back parking lot, I found the white van unoccupied, with all doors and the trunk securely locked. With a sense of urgency, I opened the red back door leading into the gym hallway adjacent to the locker rooms. The entire interior was cloaked in darkness as the main lights had been switched off. Drawing my flashlight from its holster, I used its beam to navigate the dimly lit halls. I reached the lobby of the school where a woman emerged from the front office, discreetly instructing me to investigate the boys' locker room cautiously due to the possibility of the individual being armed. Quickly calling for backup on my radio, I learned that help was already en route. Returning to the hallway I had entered from, I located the boys' locker room next to the exit and pushed the door open with utmost care. The room lacked windows, enveloping it in complete darkness, pierced only by the beam of my flashlight. White noise emanated from some ceiling vents, but amidst it I detected faint scratching noises and subtle dings on the locker doors. Although protocol required me to announce my presence as a police officer, fear held me back, intensifying the palpable tension in the room. Balancing my flashlight in one hand and my gun in the other, I stealthily moved to the opposite side of the locker room. It seemed that no matter where I positioned myself, the mysterious sounds echoed from the other side. Stationed in the corner near the door to the bathroom, the atmosphere grew more intense when the abrupt slam of a locker door in another room startled me. Following the source of the sound led me to the adjacent football team locker room, seamlessly connected to the main locker room without a separating door. The lockers here were notably larger, tripling in size. Summoning the courage, I announced my presence with a loud shout of police. In response, a terrified kid's voice pierced the room, screaming for help from somewhere within, though the sound was muffled by the locker door being pounded on. My heart sank when I realized the boy was trapped inside one of the lockers on the opposite side of the row where I stood. Determined to act, I assured them that I would return, calling for backup once again as I rushed outside. To my dismay, the white van that had initially raised suspicions was nowhere in sight, my failure being not noting the license plate. Quickly, I relayed the information to the authorities, urging them to be on the lookout for the suspicious white van. Returning to the school, I directed the front office staff to conclude the school day and dispatch someone with the key to liberate the boy from the locker. It became apparent that the man, armed with a knife, had been holding the boy captive, quietly attempting to coerce the 12-year-old into his van. The boy, bleeding from cuts sustained during the struggle, bravely resisted the man's sinister intentions. A week later, 
The van was spotted in a 7-Eleven parking lot, leading to the man's arrest after proper identification. This unsettling incident unfolded while I was staying at a Hampton Inn in New Jersey during a visit to Rowan University, a college I was considering attending. My solo journey to explore potential colleges left my family behind. After an insightful day attending campus tours, I headed to a nearby restaurant for a meal. Returning to the hotel around 8 p.m. with plans to revisit the campus the next day, I found myself unexpectedly caught in a peculiar situation. An hour after settling into my room, an unusual alarm blared, accompanied by a flashing white light in the corner of the ceiling. A looping message followed, instructing all Hampton Inn guests to remain in their rooms due to a lockdown. The concept of a lockdown in a hotel was entirely foreign to me, and the existence of such alarms was equally surprising. Rather than feeling alarmed, I found the situation more intriguing and oddly exciting. Eventually the blaring alarm ceased, but the persistent flashing light and repetitive messages continued every 20 seconds. Though it was only 9.30pm, I decided to turn on the TV for some background noise while I changed and brushed my teeth. After completing my evening routine, I turned off the lights, hopped under the covers and watched TV for half an hour before powering it down. 